Okay, I'm just going to preach this this morning, and then if we have a little bit of time for discussion at the end, we'll do that. But what time am I supposed to stop? I forgot to ask somebody. 11, 10, 10, 10, 10, 20. Okay, very good. So let's turn to Genesis 37. We're going to look, kind of overview a little bit, the life of Joseph. I imagine most of you know these points, but I think it'll be helpful to us to think about them again. There's a lot of great lessons for us in Joseph's life. You recognize that Joseph was hated by his brothers. He had 11 of them, and at least 10 of those 11 hated him. And they hated him for several reasons. In Genesis 37, 2, Genesis was, uh, Joseph was 17 when he tattled on his brothers for their work as shepherds. I'm not sure whether he should have done that or shouldn't have done that, but he did, and it made them very upset with him. Also, he was hated because he was Jacob's favorite. He had that special robe that showed everybody that he was Jacob's pet. He, uh, Jacob himself had been a victim of parental favoritism, but that didn't stop him from doing the same thing in his family. After all, Joseph was the oldest son of his favorite wife. And then there were those dreams that Joseph had that he told that implied that his parents and brothers would bow down to, to him, which also infuriated him with them. So they had all sorts of reasons to just despise Joseph, and they did. So he's 17, his brothers are out um, watching the, the sheep, herding the sheep, many miles away from home, maybe some 50 or 60 miles away. And so Jacob's concerned about them. He sends Joseph up there to check on them and see how they were doing. I've always guessed he had a care package for them too. I don't know that for sure. But he was in uniform, he had his, his robe on, and they saw him coming from a long ways off. And that robe was just like wa waving a red flag in front of a bull. So they had already decided by the time they got there that they were going to sabotage his dreams by just disposing of him, and that would be that. But Reuben suggests they not kill him, after all, he is their brother, and that they just put him in a pit. He was going to secretly rescue him later. Reuben was the oldest and probably felt somewhat responsible. But they took his robe off of him, they put him in the pit, and then they sat down to eat and drink. I'm guessing the care package that Joseph brought, who knows, it was kind of callous to see their brother that they'd put in the pit while they're enjoying a meal, and that's when the Ishmaelite traders come along and they think, well, no use killing him. Why not make a little money off of him? So they sold him as a slave, a late teenage slave, to these traders who were on their way to Egypt. Of course, then they uh, have got to figure out what they're going to tell their father, but they had already plotted their cover story. They, uh, they take Joseph's special robe and they dip it in goat's blood, and they bring it to their father. Now, that's kind of ironic, because you remember how Jacob himself had deceived his father with his brother's clothing and goat skin. Now his sons are deceiving their father with his brother's clothing and goat's blood. They don't say much. They just say in verse 32 of 37, we found this... Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Your son, they mean their brother, kind of reminds you of what the elder brother said about the prodigal son, right? But you know it's a stronger thing if they just let Jacob draw his own conclusion, which he does. He says, it's my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces and he is deeply grieved, and he continues to be deeply grieved day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. He will not be consoled. His favorite son has been torn to pieces by wild beasts. Meanwhile, Joseph is taken down to Egypt where he's sold as a slave to Pharaoh's bodyguard, the Potiphar. 
And the Lord is with him, and he actually becomes kind of the chief slave over the household. And uh, he's been greatly blessed by the Lord in that, but he, uh, he suffers from one endowment too many. He was handsome. And the Potiphar's wife falls in love with Joseph, and she does everything she can to get Joseph to have an affair with her, which would have been a strong temptation. After all, poor Joseph, it would have been awfully easy for him to feel sorry for himself under the circumstances. And we are never more vulnerable to temptation than when we feel sorry for ourselves. It gives us an easy way to rationalize giving in. He could have also let his success in the Potiphar's house go to his head. And she was persistent. She wouldn't give up. She was just hounding him forever reopening the closed question and trying to get him to give in to her. You know, temptation is not a part-time experience for believers. We're going to face constant barrages of temptation. It would have been flattering to Joseph to think about this high-up lady in the uh, Egyptian administration showing an interest in him, and finally she just grabbed him. You know, it would have been so easy to just rationalize and say, well, I'm I didn't want to, <laughs> but after all, she, she caught me. What was I going to do? Satan provides all sorts of ways to try to give excuses for our sins, but Joseph stood, stood firm, and you appreciate what he said. In verse 8, he says, this is 39.8, Behold, with me here my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he's put, me, put all that he owns in my charge, there's no one greater in this house than I, and he's withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? He doesn't say, you know, it won't work, we might get caught, or, you know, not today. He says, this is a terrible sin against God, and I will not do it. That is the way to stand up to temptation. We say no, and we, we do not give any opening to Satan. So that was helpful. He refuses to even lay down beside her. He puts himself in no possibility of being tempted. He stays firm and does the right thing even when she catches him. In verse 12, she caught him by his garment. He was just working in the house like he was supposed to be. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. Well, she screamed. And you know, lies are built on rather small, subtle things. She says, well, he was in here and uh, he took his coat off to try to force me and I screamed and he fled. All those things were almost right. She did scream. He did flee, and she's got his coat, but it wasn't like he took it off. She grabbed him by the coat, and he wriggled out of it, leaving that in her hand, and he fled before she screamed. She just kind of jumbles up the order and changes a few details, and it makes it look like Joseph was the aggressor. And so her husband puts him in prison for attempted rape. You know... Can you imagine the rumors that were going around in, in Israel about, or in Egypt about that time? Have you ever heard the expression, where there's smoke, there's fire? There's always some truth in it. Is there always some truth in a rumor? Is there always fire where there's smoke? Here's a case where that wasn't the case. That wasn't true. In this particular situation, Joseph was not guilty in any way. You do not know when you hear a rumor if there is some truth in it or not. So here is Joseph. He has done nothing wrong, sold by his brothers into slavery, falsely accused and thrown into Egyptian prison. What a terrible life. I challenge you. I bet there's not any of us here who can beat that for horrible. Cons horrible situation, horrible luck, we might say. You know, wow. I mean, that's just really cruel all the way around. And it wasn't his fault. Now, in prison, 
he starts becoming the head of all the prisoners. He's a very trustworthy man, and God is blessing him in a way. And the, uh, the cupbearer and the baker to the Pharaoh get thrown in prison, and they both have troubling dreams that, by God's help, Joseph is able to interpret. And he says the baker in three days is going to be hung, and the cupbearer in three days is going to be restored to his position. For obvious reasons, he doesn't ask the baker to remember him, but he does ask the cupbearer to remember him when he's restored to Pharaoh. But the cupbearer gets so excited about the good fortune he has, I suppose, and his problem is resolved, he promptly forgets Joseph. Kind of reminds you of those ten lepers that Jesus healed in Luke 17. Nine of them forget to even turn back and thank him. You ever been blessed by God after you prayed and prayed and then forgot to even thank God? You were not forgetting to ask him, but we get the blessing and often we forget to thank him. So he's been sold by his brothers, lied about by Ms. Potiphar that caused him to be thrown in jail, and the cupbearer forgets him. He's 30 years old, sold at 17, 30 years old in Egyptian prison. Now, we know the rest of the story, right? So we know everything turns out great. This was wonderful. And in fact, many of these things led to his, you know, having a wonderful opportunity to save his family and do all sorts of great things. But he didn't know that is how it was going to turn out. Can you imagine, at 17, sold as a slave by your brothers, sometime later lied about by Ms. Potiphar, and you're in an Egyptian prison until age 30. It takes a lot of patience to keep faith and serve God. It may be that you do what's right, and you have years of misery, an injustice. It certainly can be. Look at Job. In fact, I challenge you to do this sometime. Write a list of 10 or 15 of the people you see in the Bible that suffered the most, and then write a list of the 10 or 15 people in the Bible you consider most faithful to God, and see how many names are on both lists. It's rather amazing. When we do what's right, there's going to be injustice and suffering, we can pretty much count on it. Well, Pharaoh finally has a dream, and the cupbearer remembers Joseph. It probably worked in Joseph's favor that he had forgotten him for that length of time. He tells Pharaoh about him. Joseph's brought, by God's help, he's able to interpret the dreams, the seven years of plenty, followed by the seven years of famine, He's appointed as vice pharaoh in charge of famine relief, and he gathers up abundant grain for seven years to start selling it when the famine hits. Joseph had been faithful over small things. God had made him ruler over many things. But what if he had given in to Miss Potiphar? You never know when you give in to temptation how the Lord might have been able to use you if you'd have stayed firm and faithful. Well, the famine actually is broader than just e- Egypt. And so Joseph, uh, Joseph's family back in the land of Canaan is hungry, and Joseph's father Jacob sends the brothers, his sons, to buy grain down in Egypt. He's heard there's grain down there. He sends all the brothers except for Benjamin, the youngest, Joseph's only full brother, the other son of Rachel. She died in childbirth with him. And you know why he didn't send Benjamin. 42-4, I'm afraid that harm may befall him. The other sons are expendable, but nothing bad must happen to uh, to, to Benjamin. Benjamin has become the new Joseph, and we'll see that over and over again here. So the ten brothers go down to Egypt. Now this has been 20, 21, 22 years. They are not imagining they're going to see Joseph, and certainly not as vice Pharaoh. 
He's speaking Egyptian. He's dressed Egyptian. They have no idea it's him. But I'm guessing Joseph was looking for them, kind of expecting them to come down and buy grain. And so he calls them in and interrogates them. And they're at a hopeless disadvantage. He's a tough interrogator. And he knows a lot more than they know he knows. And it just goes from bad to worse. He accuses them of being spies. He ends up jailing them for three days, gives them a little taste of their own medicine, I suppose. And he holds one of them hostage. He, here's what he says. He says, well, listen, I think you're spies. Now, I don't know why ten brothers would travel in group if they're spies, but who cares? He's the one in charge. He can accuse them of anything he wants to. He says, I believe you're spies. Now, you've told me the story that you have this other brother back home. If you ever want to see Simeon again or buy grain again, I want him to be with you the next time. Of course, why couldn't they just pick up any guy and bring him along? You know, but again, he's the one in charge. It doesn't have to make a whole lot of sense. He says you've got to bring your brother. And he holds Simeon. Now, it's interesting he holds Simeon. Simeon was number two, but he's overheard them talking and he's found out that Reuben had tried to spare him, number one. So I suspect that's why he keeps Simeon. And they, while they're in jail, him overhearing them speaking their language, them not having any idea he understands their language, they're saying in chapter 42, 21, truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would, we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. It's been more than 20 years, and they're still feeling guilty, and when bad things happen, they interpret that as punishment for what they did to their brother. Guilt destroys you. So, they go back home with the grain they bought, only to find out when they open up their grain sacks, their money is in the top of every sack. Which is terribly disturbing to them. For the rest of us, it would have been our lucky day. We got our money. I don't know how it happened, but isn't that wonderful? But they have a guilty conscience, so everything, even the good things, they interpret as a bad sign. They tell their father that uh, Joseph well, vice Pharaoh, has kept their brother Simeon. In fact, they just call him the man every time they talk about him. And uh, their father Jacob, this is 4236, says, you have bereaved me of my children. That's more true than he knows. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Not so much but a lot of times we think they are when they're not. Then Reuben spoke to his father saying, you may put my two sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my care and I will return him to you. A lot of help it's going to be to Jacob to kill two of his grandkids if he doesn't bring Benjamin back. But that's what he can think of to say. But listen to Jacob. I think this is one of the most significant statements in this narrative. Verse 38, Jacob said, my son shall not go down with you. For his brother is dead, and he alone is left. If harm should befall him on the journey you are taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. My son will not go down with you. Who did he say that to? Remember? His... Ten sons. <laughs> My son won't go with you. He's the only one left. He just unsunned those other ten. The only one he really cares about is Benjamin. Again, Benjamin is the new Joseph. Well, they get hungry again. They eat the food. Jacob suggests they uh, go, go back down to Egypt and uh, pick up some more kind of like they were going to the store to buy a few supplies or something. And Judah explains, the man said, we can't come without our brother. And Jacob says, why did you even tell him you had a brother? <laughs> but 
but they can't go back down without him, and they insist on that. And really, if you look at it from Jacob's standpoint, he doesn't have a lot of choice. Is it going to really be any better for Benjamin to die of starvation than to risk his life sending him back to Egypt so they can buy more food? So he reluctantly agrees to send Benjamin. They get down there, and they immediately get invited for a meal with the vice Pharaoh Joseph. And they're worried about that. Their uneasy conscience interprets every development as some bad sign. And Joseph is able to meet Benjamin. It's a very moving occasion for him, but they don't know that. He has them seated at the banquet in the order of age. Ten of those brothers were born in like seven years. How he knew the age of each one was a mystery to them. And he gives five times more food to, I'm going to call him little Benjamin. You realize he's in his 20s at least. But the youngest, which is kind of bizarre too. And he's going to let them buy the grain. They, they apologize about the money. They don't know how it got back in their sacks. And the, the servant of Joseph said, oh, I had your money. Don't worry about that. And so chapter 44 and verse 1. Then Joseph commanded his house steward, saying... Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his money for the grain. You wonder what that steward thought. Put his special silver cup in the sack of the youngest? He must have really liked him. Giving him his silver cup. So they leave, and they've no more than hardly gotten out of sight. When Joseph tells the house steward in verse 4, Up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks, and which he indeed, indeed uses for divination? You have done wrong in doing this. Now that's really bizarre. <laughs> he has the house steward put the cup in Benjamin's sack and then has him chase after them to accuse them of stealing the cup. <laughs> so he does. After all, Joseph's vice Pharaoh, he does whatever he says. And he does it upright too. He gets to them and he accuses them of stealing that cup. They're indignant. They're outraged. They'd even brought back that money. How could he possibly accuse them of stealing the cup? And they say in verse 9, 44, 9, With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die. Whoa. They didn't know what they were saying, did they? And we also will be my Lord's slaves. And the servant says, Oh no, my master's very fair and just. He will only keep the one who stole the cup. He won't blame the rest of you. And so in an Oscar-winning performance, this steward starts with the oldest one's sack, opens the sack, searches through the grain, closes the sack, goes to number two, opens the sack, searches through it. One, he knows right where that cup is. He put it there. But he goes one by one. Can't you imagine those brothers? As every sack is open, the cup's not there, the cup's not there, the cup's not there, the cup's not there. They're just getting more and more outraged. How could he have ever accused them of stealing that cup? And he comes to Benjamin's sack, and he opens that sack. There is Vice Pharaoh's silver cup. Now, what would you have felt if you had been one of those brothers? That rat, that idiot, what did he think stealing that cup? Not only is he daddy's little pet, but he thinks he can go and steal that silver cup from Joseph. It would have outraged me. He puts all their lives in jeopardy because he couldn't keep his filthy hands off that cup. They could have sure felt that way, don't you see? They all come back 
device Pharaoh. And Joseph says in verse 15, what is this deed that you have done? Do you not know that such a man as I can indeed practice divination? Hey, that's my special cup. I can track you anywhere. Of course, they had the cup. But anyhow, he doesn't have to make sense. He's in charge. And Judah says, there's nothing we can say. We're guilty. We're your slaves. And Joseph said, oh, no. No, no, far be it from me to do this. The man in whose possession the cup has been found, he shall be my slave. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Do you see what Joseph's been doing all along? He has given them the perfect opportunity to betray another one of Rachel's sons. He's masterminded a strategy to find out do they still have the same character they had when they sold him 22 years before? They're going to have a lot easier time of ditching Benjamin than they had of getting rid of him because, after all, he stole the cup. He is putting them through this to find out, are they safe? Have they repented? Are they, are they, is he able to reveal himself to them? Judah's speech is just incredible. It's the longest speech in Genesis. It's a little cumbersome because he keeps using your servant, meaning himself, or the, your, your, uh, your servant, my father, meaning Jacob. But he basically begs Joseph, telling him, look, my father, he can't handle it. If we go back without this boy, it'll kill him. We told you we couldn't bring him, but you insisted, and so we brought him. But I myself told my father, I am responsible. I will bring him back. And Judah pleads with Joseph to remain a slave in the place of Benjamin, begging to sacrifice himself for a brother loved more than he was. It's the most, one of the most moving moments in the book of Genesis. And you can see, have they ever repented? They don't ever want to see their father go through that again. Twenty-some years, they can't even tell their father what really happened to Joseph. <laughs> they have changed so much. Joseph orders everyone to leave. Chapter 45, verse 1. No outsider could share this intimate moment. <laughs> verse 3. I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? It has to be him. Nobody else knew his name. It's Joseph. Can you imagine when the realization of that comes flooding over their minds, this is terrifying. Joseph has all the power of Egypt. What will he do to these brothers? They, they shy away from him. Joseph said, please come closer to me. He says, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. He's worried that they're going to be upset with themselves for having sold him. Do you take brothers who've done something that wicked to you and try to make sure they're not too down on themselves for having done that, let alone forgiving them? Why did he treat them that way? Because he saw the Lord's hand. He realized that God was the one who'd sent him. He realized all the blessing God brought out of that. I want you to think about something. Does God cause everything to work together for the good of those who love him? If something bad happens in your life, and you love God, will God bring good out of that evil? If so, why are we so upset about it? If God is in charge, and he's going to bring a blessing out of the bad things that happen to us, why do we get up so upset when somebody treats us badly? Why do we get so upset when something doesn't work well? 
if God's really bringing good out of everything that happens. Joseph was not only forgiving, he was encouraging to those brothers. And he had them go get their father and bring him back. And you know the rest of the story. Joseph spent the first 17 years of his life with his father in the land of Canaan. He spent the last 17 years of his father's life with him in Egypt. Now, you know, the Bible is just so impressive on many levels. That's a tremendous story. I mean, I thought that when I was a kid. One of the few parts of the Bible I really actually enjoyed reading when I was young was the story of Joseph. It was hard to put down, even though I knew how it was going to turn out. But there is so much depth in the Bible. I want to do something with you as we conclude this. I want to do a little riddle with you. You probably thought about this before, but I want to do it this way and just think about there's another story underneath this, so much greater than even this story. Who am I? I am the beloved son of my father. My father sent me far away on an errand of kindness. In carrying out my mission, my own people, because of jealousy, delivered me into the hand of strangers. I was sold for certain shekels of silver. I was strongly tempted, but I resisted. When an old man saw my face, he said he could die now. Think about Simeon and Jacob. Because of my righteousness, I was falsely accused and condemned. I was stripped of my robe. Two others were punished with me, though one of them was restored. God was with me and reversed the hideous injustices. I came to have all authority second only to the supreme monarch himself. Ultimately, even those who sold me bow down before me, or they will. I became the means whereby God saved the very ones who wronged me. Some of you won't get this one. But after my death, I encountered first the ten, then the eleven. Who am I? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Isn't it amazing? That when God reveals a story so moving and so helpful and so profound is the Joseph story that underneath that, he designed the whole Joseph story to be a foreshadowing of Jesus. And we can be sure that we're not doing that improperly because Stephen in Acts chapter 7 uses Joseph as a foreshadowing of Jesus. One of the things that I'd like to do with something like this is just encourage you, keep reading the Bible. Study it, read it, pour over it. There's always way more in it than any of us have ever seen. It's a treasure that we never exhaust, we never mine all the jewels in it. So keep studying it. I appreciate a lot your attention. We'll take a few minutes and prepare for our worship.